you're going to hear Robert Lemke on stage in a bit with his welcome keynote. But first, we have again Jan and Klaus with some more music. Enjoy! Enjoy. Yeah, personal welcome from me to the NEAS conference 2022. So amazing to see you in person here, although I hardly can see you, but I can see your masks. And that's a nice concept because somehow the, the light here from, from the sides make your mask glow a bit. So I see lots of white masks there. <laughs> um, yeah, that's quite crazy. Uh, to be here and also unusual for me uh, again. When I opened uh, the application keynote to create some slides, I was greeted with uh, this usual screen like, uh, what's new since version so-and-so? So I didn't open it for a year. Um, and uh, I think that's true for many who will give talks here now. Uh, it's, it's so, um, yeah, unusual to do that again, to, to stand in front of people and prepare a talk and be in a conference and so on. But it's also so important. Um, yesterday we had a little warm-up uh, in the beach club nearby here. And um, I had the chance to talk with a few people and realized how, yeah, how important that was to, to talk to each other again, to not just... Uh, see each other on the screen, and I guess it's all the same for you. I don't know who has been on a real-life conference this year already. <laughs> Nobody. Really? One. One person. Yeah? You see? So this is, that, that makes it so special, and um, I'm sure that maybe something will, uh, some things will go wrong or so, but it's like we have to get into that again um, to, to get used to having these conferences. And sprints and meetups. Remember that we had meetups uh, for NEAS and we had sprints several times a year? Um, actually, after this conference, there will be in the NEOS uh, sprint after a long time uh, with lots of people from the NEOS team and uh, others who want to join, of course. Um, and we'll be working again on special NEOS topics and this will be a special week for us. So it's important, I think, that we find back to what we had before the pandemic, uh, that we remember how we met and this cannot be replaced by some remote sessions. Because before the pandemic, people asked me, uh, how do you do that, developing something like NEOS uh, with remote teams? And people were so used to only work with um, teams located in their companies. And I would usually answer that this is only possible because we meet several times a year and know each other. And it's not so important that we work with each other when we meet, but that we know each other, that we talk, have a beer, have a coffee, and then we can also work remotely. So this cannot be replaced by just uh, a remote community. All right, so I have the honor to, to have this welcome keynote again, and um, as usual, I'll give you a little uh, look back at what happened since the last conference. Um, I hope you had a chance to see that online in that amazing studio uh, Sandstone created there. That was, it's, that was also completely unreal to be in a conference room where they had a complete TV studio set up. Um, that was really crazy. But it was also weird to only talk into a camera and not see, see you guys. 
So um, let's take a look back, and after that, I will throw some random thoughts at you, which I collected throughout the last year. And uh, yeah, I'm curious what you think about that. So the NEOS project actually started 17 years ago. That, that really makes us old, right? <laughs> and uh, the 1.0 release was eight and a half years ago in, in Nuremberg. Um, that's quite some time. And uh, the releases we had throughout the last year were 79 uh, in total. Uh, we had 31 NEOS releases, 48 uh, flow releases. And that's only possible um, by, by the work from all the volunteers to, who do the upmerges and uh, release managers. So I'd like to thank the release managers and upmerges for this amazing work. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, now my eyes adapted. I can see some faces now. So take some time. All right, so we had NEOS 7.2, um, which I, I, I won't go through all the features, but some I, I have in mind. Like uh, we had, uh, if I remember right, we had the node types in subfolders. That was very nice for bigger projects where you can organize node types into different folders. Um, and I've also seen some interesting setups how you can reuse node types by that uh, in different projects through con conventions. Uh, we had performance improvements um, in the content repository, loading big trees and uh, lots of database query optimization. So that was one of the focuses in, in 7.2. And we also had support for PHP 8 attributes. Anybody using PHP 8 attributes yet? Yeah, just a few. Uh, in general, who's using PHP 8 already? Or can I say already? <laughs> OK. Yeah, and that's, that's really nice. I, I, personally, I spent a lot of time migrating code to PHP 8.1 uh, throughout the last weeks. And it feels so nice to, uh, to use the new feature set. And um, supporting attributes was one of the, to be honest, I have to get a bit accustomed to that syntax, just the vi visual presentation of, of that. You know, I was so used to doc comments, but I think I'll get to it. Um, in that version, it was possible to use attributes, but uh, you still needed a doc comment for the interface or for the class name you want to inject, for example, right? And then uh, in the Fusion parser, we had support for the Fusion memo object. Did you know about that? Did you read that? Did you use that already? Memo object, Neo 7.2? Ah, take a look at that. Um, it can speed up certain situations because the idea of that is that it can, um, it is not called every time and not every, um, evaluated every time, but it will, um, keep the state uh, of what you store in there, and it can optimize the speed of your fusion uh, rendering a lot in certain uh, cases, of course. Then we had Neo 7.3. That was, uh, I think that was Carsten's wallpaper, right? Carsten? Yeah, and he was so happy that it finally he got a wallpaper voted. But it was all fair and transparent. Uh, <laughs> no cheating. Um, and besides that wallpaper, we had uh, further Fusion and AFX improvements. We had uh, support for custom SVG icons in the UI and uh, the new range editor, which allows you to slide from, uh, from certain uh, values in, within the range. And then we had that fancy new CLI setup. Um, which allows you to set up NEOS in a guided way from the command line instead of using uh, the web browser. So um, that can be interesting, especially for people trying out NEOS and uh, uh, preferring the console. Um, but an alternative to, to that could also be, um, of course, using a more um, 
is set up using environment variables and so on. But I think for, for getting started, this is a very helpful feature, right? Yeah, ah, right. And uh, then we had a NEOS version with uh, much improvements in terms of publishing. I don't know, when, when you have a bigger NEOS website and you publish content, it could take some time to get that published. And that was really tricky to, tricky to find out what's happening there. And it turned out that a lot of cache flushing was happening there, uh, which needed to be optimized. And so um, the result of these optimizations were that, that we have something like 20 times more uh, faster cache flushing, which can result on, um, in something like three times faster uh, publishing of your content, which really uh, pays off in, in bigger projects where you have lots of nodes and, and so on. So that was a really nice addition. Then we also have a completely new uh, Fusion parser, uh, which is now um, uh, based on a proper Lexa and parser and, and uh, object AST and so on. So that's quite fresh. Um, I haven't heard of any severe uh, bugs yet, but um, that, that was really moderni um, modernizing uh, what we already had without changing what you see. That's always a nice thing. I and then finally, we had uh, integration of something which was only available as a um, plug-in yet, so, and that's user impersonization. Uh, something uh, we had actually, when um, uh, Andy Fertner created the security framework for Flow, there w there's one line of code, and, and that must be like, I don't know, <laughs> seven years ago, uh, where he wrote, and this would be the point where you need to implement uh, impersonization, <laughs> something like that. So we finally got that. Um, and that's really helpful for providing support to users, of course. Uh, by the way, if, if that doesn't exist yet and someone feels like it, one, thing, one feature I miss um, also for seven years now is some kind of maintenance mode where you can display uh, messages to users like, this instance will uh, be in maintenance in one hour from now, and then you cannot edit anything anymore. So if you feel like creating such a feature, or a read-only mode for NEOS, for that, oh, that would be awesome. Maybe that's your next feature you, you may be working on. Um, Right, and also in Flow 8, and that means also in NEOS 8, we raised the minimum requirement to PHP 8. And that's, that's a really helpful step, I think, uh, because we finally can uh, use features like, and we support features like type properties, union types, uh, we have um, PHP annotations, but also support for enums, for example. Anybody already used enums? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the guys I suspected to use enums already. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> I really love them, um, especially when you combine them with something, with value objects uh, of other uh, types and uh, things like GraphQL. That really helps a lot. Um, Right, and then we also have support for value objects. You know that we have some kind of mapping logic in Flow. Uh, we have this object access uh, class, which allows you to uh, kind of, in a, in a uniform way, call setters and getters and all that. And now we also have support for uh, value objects like uh, factory methods, for example, like from array. So if Flow needs to convert um, some serialized data from an array to a value object, it will try to find a from array method and, and do that. And the same goes for from string and so on. So that's also very helpful when you work a lot with value objects. Right, and then a little addition, uh, we have um, improvement of the um, 
annotation support. So now you can leave out the doc comment in flow 8 and just write something like that. Yeah, so that is roughly uh, what we've seen as new features and additions in NEOS uh, throughout the last year. And I want to uh, report shortly about what the NEOS Foundation did uh, during that time. It's mostly boring. Uh, but that's also the idea um, that the NEOS Foundation is not representing the project. As you know, the NEOS team is doing that. The NEOS team is deciding on new features and everything like that. We have the Marketing Guild, and so and that's all not part of the NEOS Foundation. Um, the NEOS Foundation is basically the back office of the NEOS project. And that is something um, Marika and now Sandra have been doing a lot uh, from Sandstorm. They have uh, been doing all the paperwork, and uh, Tobias was also busy uh, taking care of taxes and, and everything like that. We have, of course, the, um, the sponsoring um, process where you can buy badges and, and all that. That's working all fine now. And my very exciting task is uh, defending the NEOS trademark, and that is so uh, so stupid. I mean, that, that you have to do that. I mean, we have this nice logo, and we want to keep it, right? So if we don't defend it, uh, it could happen that we are not allowed to use our own logo anymore. So that's why we have to defend it. And we have these trademarks, we have European tra trademarks, um, we have trademark uh, in the US and Canada, and also recently uh, in the UK. And now other companies are trying to register trademarks which are called NEOS or have basically the same N and, and so on. And then we have to write in opposition and talk with lawyers. And because it's in the UK, we cannot use a, our lawyer in Berlin, and we need to ask a different lawyer who has an office in the UK, and so on. So that was the amazing work uh, I <laughs> did for the NEOS Foundation, writing a lot of emails and spending money for lawyers, unfortunately. But on the other hand, fortunately, we have a lawyer uh, who's very, very fair in, in terms of what we need to pay. So they, they really make a very good, very good price. Um, we mentioned that already, but um, we could use some more money, not only for trademarks, but also for all the other things uh, the NEOS Foundation does as a back office. And now that we are resuming to work in sprints and so on, it would very help us, help us very much um, so that we, for example, could pay for uh, travel expenses for people coming to the sprints and so on. So um, take the opportunity to either become a sponsor, um, or maybe upgrade. So we still don't have a diamond sponsor, I think. And no platinum. Maybe something for you. Right, so that was about um, what happened. And, well, that, that's of course not all that happened. And the question is, uh, what do you address in a keynote at a developer conference, um, you could just wear like a little ribbon and, and then uh, only talk about technology and so on, but I can't. I, because it's the first time now I, I also can talk with my friends here, um, and of course we talk about how crazy times we had uh, during the last two years and what crazy times we still have. So if someone asks you, um, like today, for example, uh, hi, so-and-so, uh, is everything fine? Who says, yeah, fine? Who says that? I do, usually. So like, because what can you tell? Like, yeah, the 95th uh, percentile of fineness is reached in most cases. Or <laughs> it's a complex answer. Um, and I think currently, with the war going on, uh, this, this crisis, um, I mean, we, we had lots of crises before, 
but that feels a bit different for many of us because we feel touched because it's, it, it threatens our own desire to live. We feel like this feel much closer to this now for some reason. And we can talk about why, why it's bad that we didn't feel like that before, but it's, it's that way. So um, I know that lots of people have fear, and I certainly felt very frightened um, in the first two weeks or so of the uh, war. And I really had to disconnect from news and, and so on uh, because it, it was doing something uh, to me which was not very healthy. Um, so what helped me was to remember that this fear can be amplified, of course, by the news we consume. And do you remember um, the talk about cognitive bias uh, last year by, by Jennifer Blatz? Where I think that was a really nice and, and funny talk, but it, it showed us so many dis misconceptions about how we perceive things and um, how we fall into the trap of, of cognitive biases. So I um, can recommend a book, actually. Um, it's called Factfulness, um, and this is from their website, gapminder.org, which is really worth looking at. Um, this is one, just one of the things which can go wrong in, in your perception. So you have that attention filter. So you have everything which is happening, and we only perceive what passes that attention filter, of course, because otherwise we would completely go crazy if we would process everything which is happening out there. And now some people say, yeah, but the media is only reporting the bad stuff and, and so on. We, I mean, they cannot afford to produce any content which does not bypass our attention filter. So we cannot really blame them, right? We can blame them if they just do that for the purpose of getting more clicks and so on. But we cannot blame them that they choose topics which pass our attention filter. That's just natural. And that's also no problem as long as we know that this is not the reality. This is just a part of the reality. So imagine the media would actually report on good things, uh, like, yeah? <laughs> An aircraft landed successfully, and there was enough tomato juice for the whole flight. Um, this wouldn't bypass your attention filter. You wouldn't really, wouldn't even recognize it. So that's why it doesn't happen there. So. Good news is not news, but it's there. And keep remembering that maybe if you hear something which is really bad, maybe there's just some other news you don't know about which is really good, but which is not reported. Maybe some... Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So ask whether there's equally positive news uh, which uh, just that didn't reach you. Also, uh, there are some other tricks. I can really get, go, uh, recommend going to gapminder.org and, and see these uh, ideas there. Um, sometimes you would just be confronted with numbers like five million children died last year from that, I don't know, so and so. And what do you do with that number? Isn't that scary? I mean, four million children died, but there's no context. You cannot do anything with that number. You need to know, for example, how many died the year before. And if it was five million, this is really good news, right? So that helped me um, putting news I read uh, into context helped me to, to digest that in a better way and feeling more relaxed about it. But what really makes me angry is if this is not about cognitive bias, but about manipulation, right? Because there are psychologists working for the 
dark side of the media outlets who really know all the tricks uh, to trigger you and manipulate information. And it doesn't e even mean to make up news, but just to pick only those news and those news. So it's, it gets completely biased. And that is, of course, happening in Russia, for example, but it's also happening elsewhere. So can you imagine just theoretically that so many people would support such a war if they had all the information, if they were completely informed? I cannot imagine that, that a whole population would then support a war or even make it possible that uh, certain people are getting uh, elected for a presidency or so. But of course, that is um, a theoretical question. We cannot make sure that everyone is completely realistically informed. Um, but what we can do, of course, is uh, try to work on something we have uh, expertise in. And we are using social media, but we are working in the internet, we are involved in projects. And maybe we find some opportunities here and there where we can uh, make it harder to, to spread misinformation. So, for example, before you share something in your social media channel, then uh, take a closer look at it, if it's really true, and, and so on. That, that already makes it different. And teach others who are not so familiar with these concepts. But also, if you are involved in projects dealing with information, uh, then just don't do your developer job but also think about what, what happens, what you are developing there. What, what is it tracking, you know, for example. Yeah, um, I like that cover from Time magazine. We don't know yet what will happen with Elon Musk buying Twitter. Um, but something I stumbled over is um, Elon Musk buys it because he can, and <laughs> and it's a toy, right? Uh, which was missing in his collection. But also what he says is that he wants to establish freedom of speech. And what I stumbled over is, uh, which I was r not really aware of, for example, in Germany, we don't have freedom of speech. We don't have Redefreiheit. We have freedom of opinion. So you cannot just say everything you like. It's not allowed to say anything you like. There are some things you cannot say, which are forbidden to say because they are completely wrong. And I think there's, there's an important difference between freedom of opinion. You can have your opinion, but you cannot um, claim that there's no war going on in Ukraine, for example. That's not allowed. And so that's what I'm a bit scared of, that he wants to establish freedom of speech with no strings attached. And yeah, <laughs> Trump comes back to Twitter, uh, whatever. Um, so why am I telling this on a developer conference? This is quite political stuff. Um, but on the other hand, politics isn't something politicians only do. I mean, they are elected and hopefully do what people elected them for. But on the other hand, every person is uh, political in, in some way and can contribute politically just by um, fostering certain ideas, by changing behavior. For example, if it would turn out that Twitter is really taking a wrong turn, we could all stop using Twitter, and that would make a difference, of course. Uh, and that's already politics, right? Um, yeah, we do a little experiment. I set up uh, a Mastodon uh, instance uh, on neos.social. So everyone who wants uh, can register uh, there now. <laughs> and uh, create a Mastodon account and see uh, what happens if the NEOS community um, uses uh, that social media for 
uh, discussing topics around NEOS, but also using that in, in some particular cases instead of Twitter, for example. So I have no idea if that will be like a, a nine-day fly or something, or uh, what happens to it. But the instance is there, and let's, let's do that experiment if you like. Um, so I cannot promise that it will be there forever, but if I ever need to shut it down again, uh, I will let you know uh, months in advance. And uh, the nice thing about Mastodon is that you can actually export all your data and then move it to some other instance. So you won't lose uh, your posts and uh, followers and, and so on. So yeah, if you like, it's open for registration. Okay, so where's my line of thought? Uh, I, I talked about something about war, then misinformation, and feeling uncomfortable, and what can we do? Um, but in these times, uh, what people are striving for is simplicity and coffee. <laughs> and that's just natural, I mean, the simplicity part. Um, because the, the world is too complex to handle everything at once, so we try to simplify. And actually, that's what every developer can, uh, can connect to. Uh, we don't create a model of the reality. Domain-driven design is not creating a model of the reality with everything which is happening in every microsecond, but we try to make it simple so we can put it into code. So. That's just a natural thing to do. We want simplicity. And the question is, if there's a lot of trouble going around, how do we get to simplicity? And um, if things get too chaotic, people are asking for order. Yeah. They sometimes just like rules which put an end to all the chaos. And it depends a bit from which culture you come. So in China, for example, it's easier to have strict rules with lockdowns and everything than in Germany, for example. But in general, there's a history of people asking for order. And that is a good time for extremists to, to just you know, say something like, a strong state will solve all the problems. And Isolation will protect us from the rest of the world. So, you know that, and uh, you know the history. And where did I come from now <laughs> talk here with a picture of uh, the Weimarer Republik? Um, but this lie to say, let's put some order into it and then we get simplicity, that, that's a lie powerful enough to get into powerful positions, as we've seen in the USA, in Germany, Turkey, Russia. But too much order will lead to instability again. And you can try to... Uh, you can try to... Carry on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For social media, I guess. <laughs> you can try to... Um, uh, this is interesting. <laughs> well, you can uh, try to get around all these rules, and then it looks like everything is in order, um, and have creative ideas, but in general, uh, too much order will also create instability because people will be unhappy. So what we are really looking for is a balance, and um, or I was looking for a balance. How, how do you deal with all these news? There are so many nice things, and can you celebrate the nice things if you have bad news? And that made me crazy. So, um, I don't know, how, how did you deal with uh, these thoughts? Did you just stay at your desk and work, and then was it just like before, or did you have any certain concept to deal with it? Yeah, that's an open question. I have to ask you uh, over a coffee, I guess. But I can try to 
I don't know if that works. Uh, I can try to show you. Let's see. Um, I, I had my little strategy to deal with that. I don't know if that works. Can you try to put that on, on the beamer here? Yeah? Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll show you something. Um, OK, uh, I'll, I'll be back in a second. Um, I need to find something here. And oh, that's quite dark. I open that door here. Let's see. Um, Yeah, so welcome to the place I literally uh, spent most of the time during the last two years, um, at least apart from my home office. Um, yeah, these are the woods I, I usually spend. Oh, <laughs> Carsten, hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> also, what a coincidence. Yeah, filming the woods. Um, yeah, so I, I was taking lots <laughs> of walks here um, and just to leave the house and to get a few uh, new thoughts. And in the beginning, I thought I, I need to find new paths every time because it felt a bit like, yeah, it was a bit boring. But after a while, it felt uh, meditative uh, to, to walk the same paths because I didn't have to think really. And it gave, and gave me uh, space for thinking about new things and also for discovering new things. So, for example, last week, when I walked by this bench here, I realized that there's a water sign, um, which tells me that there's a water installation. And I wondered, uh, why is there a water pipe in the middle of the woods? And uh, if, if you look at these numbers here, and so 18 is, is kind of uh, identifier for this installation. And then uh, this number here tells me that there's a water installation 30 centimeters left from the sign and 31.7 uh, meters behind me. And at the same time, four meters right next to me, uh, which doesn't, doesn't really make sense. <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> does, bullshit. doesn't really make sense. So this uh, looks like a fake um, sign and uh, close, uh, yeah, at the, uh, at the side to it, you see that there's a lid uh, which says measuring point. Uh, but there are also two uh, letters GC, which is for geocache. And when you open it, you see a USB port, uh, which probably gives you access to some interesting data. So, yeah, if you walk around the woods um, and let your mind wander and give give room for uh, thoughts then you might discover new things and i try to apply that also to my other routine work i do in programming so i don't i'm not uh yeah bored by uh refactoring lots of classes but try to use the opportunity to discover something new in the code base and as you cannot uh walk in the woods all the time so i better go back to dresden yeah bye. right bye Oh, yeah, um, right, so that was our little forest. <laughs> that was quite some ride, <laughs> pretty dark out there. Um, yeah, so I tried to create that ba balance and when I try to motivate myself, uh, I have that urge to clean up. You know that? So for example, when I change something in the code, um, I first need to clean up and convert this to PHP 8.1. Um, you know, have these nice little macros there, throw away the constructor here. I have a life template, ROP, read-only property. <laughs> and now it's everything is clean, and now I can actually continue to to work on what I originally wanted to do. 
It's spring now, or it's turning spring, and you have that urge to clean up your house, right? Um, and that's a bit what you do uh, also in programming, but you don't do that only in spring, but hopefully every day, and that is actually called refactoring. So, um, understanding the code by just cleaning it up a bit is really one of the nice things of refactoring. And I mentioned that for two reasons. I put up this slide so many times already. It's 17 years ago, but this is actually a refactoring session. So I, this was 70 years ago. It was on 26th of May 2005, and I just read the book about refactoring and was telling my teammates back then uh, all about it and said, we need to refactor type of three. And you see, I realized, who's taking notes? Yeah, Carsten is. <laughs> um, so refactoring is something which helps me a lot in programming, because um, only by that you can do big changes in a proper way without being scared to death. But also, I realized that refactoring helps me in real life. And that is kind of the story I wanted to tell you, that, for example, before I started building my new wooden terrace, uh, everything was chaotic in uh, the place where I had my tools, so I had to organize my tools first in order to then start uh, with a big project. And this is the same in, in code and in life, so always you need a proper place where you can jump from and then you can dare to jump. So in NEOS, we have a big track record of refactoring. Um, we just refactored um, the NEOS Fusion parser, but we also had lots of other things which were completely rewritten, rebuilt, and so on. Um, and it worked pretty well. So today, I'm excited that there's a new big change coming up, um, which the NEOS team plans to do in NEOS 9. NEOS 9. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> isn't that nice to get an applause for a number? And NEOS 9, uh, the, the idea, so it's, this is not an announcement because you don't buy anything, this is just uh, the plan of the NEOS team. We want to branch off to NEOS 9 next week and then continue developing NEOS 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 from that branch and then in parallel merge all and, and create all the necessary um, changes to make the new event source content repository the only content repository in NEOS 9. Yeah. So uh, Sebastian will tell you more about that tomorrow, how the new features will look like, and but also how that what that means concretely for you. Uh, how can you probably prepare for that change uh, and what will change and so on? But it will be a big change, and I'm very confident that we can do that because so much great work has been done already in the last few word, a few years. And uh, the team is very experienced with refactoring, so this, is, uh, this will be an amazing change. And it will be also a big innovation. Try to find something like that. I actually looked into search engines and was looking for event source content repositories. Maybe I missed something, but I didn't find anything about it apart from NEOS. You only find NEOS there. And yeah, I'm looking forward to, to these opportunities. Um, I, I really love that approach. And uh, I'm excited for next, year, uh, next week's sprint, right? So, okay, with that crazy thoughts, I don't know if you remember the beginning of the talk, or <laughs> but with that, uh, I, I'd like to welcome you again, and thank you very much to be uh, so brave to listen until here and get inspired by all the speakers and the chats you have throughout the conference. So welcome at the NEOS conference.
Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you for ah, uh, yeah. this keynote and your crazy thoughts. Yeah, crazy. Thanks a lot. Random. <laughs> uh, I was so skeptical, you know, uh, when I prepared that, because it was literally these thoughts I had through my walks in, in the woods. And can you actually put that into a talk? I mean, how, how dare I? <laughs> <laughs> and you dared. <laughs> Well, how does it feel being back on stage here? Unreal, still. Isn't it? <laughs> no, yeah. it's, it's so nice. It's really nice. And yeah, what, what can I say? Uh, how does it feel for you? It's strange. Strange. <laughs> strange. <laughs> it is still unreal, as you said. Yeah. But it feels good. Yeah. Again. And we will see you tomorrow again, I think. Yeah. I'll on have this another stage talk. Or the Next. stage here, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I, I got a question. Yeah. Where do you get your positive news from? Where do I get my positive news? Actually, they are there. Um, <laughs> but for example, there, there, are some, uh, there are even some TV magazines which uh, report about everything in the world, but they sometimes also have some news which are you know, which pass our attention filter, but they are positive. Like, uh, three years ago, we went into this town here, and look what happened in the meantime. So mm -hmm. sometimes you really need to look for it. And, but on the other hand, I, th I think it was not so difficult to find positive things, but being allowed to be happy about it when everything is so bad, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. This is so crazy. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thanks again. This this is a live conference. We are already a bit behind schedule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is not yeah. bad. We take your time, take your time for socializing. We're gonna um, have some music again now for you. Yes. And we have a short break and then around eleven fifteen we have on this stage Stefan with uh, Economy Times of Corona. And uh, on the studio stage, we have Karan Singh uh, about microservices. And um, please give again a big applause to Robert. Thank you. Thank you all for being back. To you. Thanks. Thanks.